Welcome to a movable feast being given in Paris. I very much hope you have an interesting and enjoyable evening. I'm uh, Peter Brown, Academic Director of the University of Kent's Paris School of Arts and Culture here at Week Hall. This event, as you know, is part of the Being Human Festival based in the School of Advanced Study at the <coughs> University of London. Now, each year, the festival, over a period of two weeks, generates a swathe of activities across the United Kingdom in order to celebrate a broad range of humanities disciplines and discourses and stir debate about their vital contribution to the culture and well-being of the nation. To give you some idea of the scale of activity, today alone there are no fewer than 12 events happening simultaneously under the theme of hope and fear around the country. But this is the very first time that the Being Human Festival has left the British Isles. And I think this is very much the kind of Brexit that all of you Now, that said, the organisers do have a kind of bridgehead here, an advanced party in the form of the University of London Institute in Paris, ULIP, with whom we are pleased to share the hosting of this evening's activities. They have been overseen by my colleague at ULIP, Dr. Anna Louise Mill, standing at the back of the lecture theatre, Director of Graduate Study and Research in collaboration with the Being Human team at Senate House, the University of London's headquarters. Now, we're here to think about Ernest Hemingway's A Movable Feast, or in its French version, Pariette en Fête, and its role in the aftermath of the Paris attacks of just over a year ago. And to that end, we've assembled a distinguished discussion panel, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce its members to you. In the centre, Sarah Churchwell, who is director of the Being Human Festival and one of the UK's most prominent academics. She is a regular contributor to the BBC's Question Time and Current Affairs television programme, where she's known for her forthright views on anything from literacy to the results of the recent US election. And of course, those two topics are connected. <laughs> She holds the Chair of Public Understanding of the Humanities and is Professorial Fellow in American Literature in the Institute of English Studies at the School of Advanced Study, University of London. She's the author of The Many Lives of Marilyn Monroe in 2004 and Careless People, Murder, Mayhem and the Invention of the Great Gatsby in 2013. Claire Joubert, on your right, is Professor of English Literature at Université Paris 8 and an expert on poetics and politics, on comparative approaches to literature, and on post-colonial theory and its applications. Her most recent book is Critique de l'Anglais, Poétique et Politique d'une langue mondialisée, 2015, and she is editor of numerous collaborative volumes. Joanna Walsh, on your left, is a fiction writer and author of Hotel, Vertigo, Grow a Pair, and Fractals. That's Four different items, by the way, not one title. <laughs> Her writing has been published by Granter and in a wide range of anthologies and magazines. She reviews for The New Statesman and The Guardian, edits At 3 AM magazine and Catapult, and is the founder of At We Women. She's a judge on the 2016 Goldsmiths Prize, that's a literary award for fiction that opens up new possibilities for the novel. So please join me in welcoming our discussion panel to Recall. Now, we want to make this an evening that is varied in its mode of presentation and also interactive, so there will be more than one opportunity to engage you all in discussion and for you to ask questions. And we'll also introduce one or two readings as the evening goes on to generate different perspectives on the topic. But I want to begin by turning to Sarah and asking you, Sarah, if you could say a little bit more about the festival, about the occasion for this particular event, and the issues that this event raises for you. Absolutely. Um, thank you all for coming, and thank you, Peter, and uh, the University of Kent and Europe for hosting us. As Peter said, this is our first international event, which is very exciting, and I'm genuinely delighted that it could be here in, at Reed Hall in the heart of Montparnasse. As Peter mentioned, I, uh, I work on F. Scott Fitzgerald, and, um, and I was saying earlier, you can't work on F. Scott Fitzgerald and not end up working on Ernest Hemingway, it just isn't possible. 
um, and not if you're doing your job. And, um, and so this is a, a part of Paris that, um, it's, it's the part of Paris that I know best, I don't know Paris very well, but I know this neighborhood. And, um, and it is a, a, a wonderful opportunity to do what we are trying to do in the festival, which is to bring research to life, to bring history to life, to show people what the contexts are of the ideas that we are all talking about and thinking about, and to say, this is, these ideas and these stories are embedded in the fabric of cities and societies and cultures. And what happens if we go out of the classroom, and, okay, we're here in a lecture room, but it's still in the middle of what uh, Hemingway is talking about in Movable Feast, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, but just a, a, another a couple of words about the festival itself. As Peter said, our theme this year is Hope and Fear. Uh, I was congratulated the other day for our prescience in choosing that as our theme for 2016. Um, and and uh, I said that I would rather have been wrong and for everybody to say, why would you choose Hope and Fear? That seems like a strange theme for 2016. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but here we are. Um, the festival is sponsored by the University of London, but also by the British Academy and uh, a funding group in, in Britain called the Arts and Humanities Research Council. And what that means is that we can put on over 250 events that are all free to the public. So the purpose of the festival is to get research out into the public that helps support it with their taxes, and to do that in an accessible, non-academic way, but in ways that are bringing serious academic research to life, um, hopefully in creative ways, and hopefully in ways that are interactive and participatory for the audience, so that um, there's less lecturing and more discussion and more moving around and more encountering ideas than, and rather than just sitting and passively listening to them. We're in partnership with 72 universities around the UK, and, um, and there are activities in 45 towns and cities, including now Paris. Um, the, as I say, the, the purpose of the, of the festival itself is um, to try to celebrate the work that is done in the humanities in the country and around the world, but also um, to advocate for it, to talk to, to, to raise its visibility and to remind people of the importance of, of the humanities. Um, the way that this event came about was it was actually very it came about very naturally and very serendipitously. Uh, I came to Paris last year to um, talk to Emily and Tim at ULIP about all kinds of things. And my trip, co we planned it before, but my trip coincided. Um, it, it happened about just about a week after the uh, Paris attacks. And it was at that time that I was reading that a movable feast had just become a bestseller in the aftermath of the attacks. And in fact, that was one year ago today um, that there were news stories about the fact that a movable feast and suddenly become a bestseller. Is that something that, that you guys, if you were all in Paris last year, was that something that you encountered and, and experienced, that a movable feast was suddenly something that people were talking about? Okay, um, so some, some yes, some no. It, it made, it made um, the news in, in Britain and in America as well. It had shot to, to the top of the Amazon bestseller list and was, um, and was being placed on uh, shrines um, around the attacks. And of course, one of the reasons for this is very simply the, uh, t the title of the, uh, in English we call it a movable feast, but its French title is, as Peter said, is Paris de Fête. And so the idea that Paris is a celebration was an instant, uh, you know, defined message, a refutation of what those attacks were trying to do to Paris, and Paris standing up and just saying with a message, Paris is a celebration. And this book, uh, is a celebration of uh, much of what we all love most about Parisian culture, cafe culture. This book is about cafe culture. It's about literary culture. It's about conversation. It's about ideas. It's about a passion for art and about how important that is, uh, particularly to a young man who's trying to become an artist, that he would have to come to Paris. Uh, from my point of view, as an American who lives abroad, but is a, a scholar of American literature, that, um, although, we, as I say, we can see the reasons why this book would respond to people, it was still very interesting to me that Parisians would pick up a book that had been written 50 years earlier by an American and was you know, in translation and was about a Paris of almost 100 years before that, because, of course, he was writing it in the 1950s and 1960s about the, um, the 1920s. And so we started talking about the importance of art and storytelling in times of crisis and trauma, the fact 
that in the wake of these atrocities, this is what people did. They turned to stories, they turned to books. They said, this symbolizes what we're about. This is what you can't have. This is what you can't destroy. And there's something about the spirit and the intellect that people were, um, were defending and, um, and insisting that this is, this is, what, this is re what represents our culture. This is what represents our civilization. And um, you mentioned, Peter, the, um, the <laughs> speaking of atrocities, the election in my, uh, in my country um, two weeks ago now, um, which has been a devastating um, event, I know, for many people outside of America, but certainly um, for Americans. It has called into question a lot of what we thought we understood about our society. And this brings me full circle back to the point of the festival itself and why I am um, so pleased to be able to talk about this book and these ideas right now. A year ago when we started talking about this, um, this event, it, if you had said to me that I would be talking about the election of Donald Trump as the president of my country, I would tell you you're absolutely out of your mind. Um, it was just unthinkable and absurd. Ludicrous. Yes, I know. It still is. Uh, it is a, I, 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 Trump does tend to distract people and people want to you know, uh, get in there, and I know that. I know that feeling very, very well. Um, but I want to make a broader point before um, uh, turning over to, to my fellow panelists. Um, which is about the, the, the ideas behind this festival and the importance of ad advocating for the humanities. I don't know if this is true in, in France, but in America and in Britain, we have a little bit of a problem with the word humanities itself. It's very abstract and people often don't even know what it means. Um, and so it, we're talking about the teaching of history. We're talking about the study of literature. We're talking about the study of art and language, but we're also talking about the methods of the humanities. We're talking about debate. We're talking about evidence-based thinking. We're talking about critical thinking. We're talking about challenging one's premises. We're talking about pushing against confirmation bias. All of the best practices and thinking of research in the humanities are intimately intertwined with the processes of liberal democracy with the democratic order, and of course by liberal democracy I don't mean party political, I mean in the old, in the traditional sense of a, of enlightenment uh, democracy. And it's important to remember when we talk about democracy and about trying to shore up the democratic order, to remember that writers invented democracy. Democracy was invented, and, and so was human rights, uh, by Voltaire, by Rousseau, by Locke, by Burke, by Jefferson. The revolutions of the 17th and 18th centuries against monarchs in uh, Britain, France, and America, they built republics. That's how it happened. But it was through the ideas put forward by writers. And what happened was we created a shared democratic order through ideas that were advanced by the humanities and that the humanities have safeguarded and protected ever since. And it's no coincidence to me, and again, I don't know if this is true in France, it's certainly true in Britain and America, that we're in a, um, a culture where we're told that the humanities are a luxury that we can't afford in times of austerity. Well, I think it's no coincidence that in the last 10 or 15 years, people have said, well, we can dispense with the humanities, and suddenly we find that democracy isn't working very well anymore. It doesn't work very well without those foundational subjects because they are its bedrock. And so, the, I think that, uh, from my point of view, and again, I'm not talking about party politics, but the way that the democracy works is under real threat um, in ways that I, that I would never uh, have, have dreamed about. I think that we need to come back to ideas about how we draw the line, where we draw the line, and it's in books like The Movable Feast, where Hemingway, kind of, for all the things that he does in it, and he, there are betrayals in it, um, but he also plants his flag, and there are certain values that he stands by. He says, this is what we believe in. This is what we're about. And it is a love letter to Paris. It is a love letter to art, to literature, and to culture. And it seems to me, therefore, that it helps us draw those lines. It helps us resituate ourselves and say, as I said a minute ago, this is what we're about, and how can we, uh, how can we defend that, and how can we preserve that? That was a little bit longer than I meant it to be. I'm sorry. No. But I had to do the festival and the book, so I had to come together. Sorry. Thank you, sir. I'm going to ask Claire and Joubert if she has anything she would like to comment on. Thank you very much. Um, actually, 
I sort of prepared some points that I wanted to share with you, but they are, as I actually expected, completely in continuation and, and also in debate with um, what you presented in some of the key terms that you threw out in the conversation. I must apologise for my voice. Um, I'm going to focus more on being human in Paris and less on Hemingway because I'm much less than a connoisseur. But uh, I want to start by expressing my warm thanks for including me in this exciting project. And I just love this very clever founding idea and already impressive achievements of the festival. Um, and I just love the clever idea of this Paris satellite evening, um, which I find very astutely focused um, uh, for uh, the structural question of how we articulate intellectual work with uh, both the urgency of current, current events and with public discussion, public debate. In our case, the context is the November anniversary, uh, but also its resonance with the Brexit mess and the flaring up of European populisms and the daily dismay at seeing who Donald Trump is gradually gathering for his pres presidential entourage. My own regular interest as an academic is in the movable nature, if I uh, can allow myself for that, uh, of political and cultural meanings, especially when they work across languages. Um, and um, my take is very much um, what your own terms are, which is that as an academic, I think it's crucial to um, open to public discussion what academic work and debates consist in. So I'd like to suggest three starting points to feed into our conversation tonight on the humanities in the, in the public sphere and especially what contribution literary and modern language scholarship can make. So the three points are one, humanities, two, literature, three, Paris. So, I was really interested um, in your questioning, you know, taking a step back from humanities as the uh, identity label for what we do. Um, uh, uh, um, all the more as humanities in Paris don't look the same at all. Uh, they have a different story and they result in different outlooks on, uh, or outlooks to offer um, in the present. So, this humanity was one of the explicit targets of 1968 revolution of universities uh, nationwide, which brought, back, brought, down the Sorbonne, brought down the Sorbonne in particular with much of its classical and Renaissance inherited forms of knowledge. This humanity. Uh, and the radical spirit of the 60s in Paris which travelled to and got transformed in the process by anglophone intellectual spheres uh, under the label of theory, developed a Freudian, neo-Marxist, neotic, postmodern critique of humanism as metaphysical, exclusionary, and ethnocentric. So this is a, a reminder uh, of some of the context. In our later and current interesting times, it's interesting to note the re-emergence, or I've been interested to note, the re-emergence of les humanités as a positive value uh, and as something to advocate for and, and fight for um, in an unwitting anglicism, which actually comes from mostly the US vocabulary of defending the humanities and defending the, the humanities in, in, in the universities. Um, so, in the defense of humanities, as they are singled out, as you were saying, but I'll add another actor to the, another agent in the whole story, singled out by the neoliberal transformation of the university uh, worldwide. So, the modèle américain uh, of the humanities in France is used both uh, currently in the neoliberal rhetoric uh, and in the terms for protest and for defence. To me, the 
know the defense of humanities and the defense of literature and the defense of La Princesse de Clèves. I thought I'd honor this. I'm um, not sure everybody's uh, aware of this. Uh, some while back, Sarkozy, 2006, uh, uh, Sarkozy uh, did some very nasty, made some very nasty comment about the absurdity of teaching La Princesse de Clèves, which is a, a classic French novel, uh, for uh, national civil service uh, exams. Uh, and so we had Une Marche de tous les savoirs, which we, which we called Academic Pride, and here you see the protesters, that's me, uh, hurling La Princesse de Clèves <laughs> to, to the government. Uh, <clears throat> So, but to me, okay, so the defensive uh, position is a weak, a weaker uh, answer. Defending values, although I, particip I participated in the protest, defending values, defending the de Duclerc, finding cons consolation in a cultural us is a risky strategy uh, in times of the war of identities which is opening. Uh, or continuing. Uh, what is always needed is more, um, more, more so the historicizing of values, and this is coming back to your point as well, the historicizing of values and the reinventing of values, the reinventing of cultural, political and critical projects um, for the humanities included. Second point, literature. What can this task look like as we try to get our heads around the legacy of the November attacks and the Trump effect? One, historicize, historicizing literary study. Uh, being prudent with the idea of the humanizing theory of literature. And being prudent with taking the name of our disciplinary era to literally. In its name, the idea of teaching literature as a humanizing process, Matthew Arnold understood both a Hellenizing of literature and a Hellenistic classical uh, model connected with the, roles of the role of classics in the civilizing culture, politics of empire. And in its name, he conceived of culture as sweetness and light, you know, culture, literature, English literature, as uh, uh, there to please and enlighten us, as a bulwark against barbarism, or what he called it in his time, famous title, 19, uh, sorry, 1869, Culture and Anarchy, Anarchy. In, today, in today's terms, possibly the translations would be terrorism, the bikini, and the crisis of liber liberal democracy. So Paris in this context, for me is less a feast, less a space for literary values or for humanist values, and more the space for the dangerous protracted state of emergency, which uh, gives tools to a potential, a potential Madame Le Pen president that are seriously scary. Um, <clears throat> so the problem with being human is always the possibility of uh, in, uh, imagining inhuman parts of humanity. Um, so possibly the, the project should be the critical uh, reinvention of values and the critical work of literary studies um, as a constant reconstruction. Post-colonial literary studies in particular have radically uh, transformed and reconstructed what we understand by literature and what literature does in the present time and in, in historical times. Um, as they have worked to provincialize the European notion of literature and of humanism. Um, now the question is, in the, you know, a year after the November attacks, with the Trump future, etc., the question is how we conceive of literature, what literature we read and study and produce, of course. <laughs> so last point, Paris. Um, I came back to Paris just before the November attack last year, uh, from spending a month researching in India. 
And so uh, coming from a viewpoint on global terrorism, which is also very uh, vivid, but again moved, displaced. My first reaction was, Syria is here. Paris is Syria. Um, I knew it, but now I know it. Uh, it has extended right into our personal lives, rather than being daily on TV. Um, and so, to me, the academic response, or certainly my academic response, has been the appalling effort, this is my uh, Virginia Woolf mantra, the appalling effort of literature and of literary scholarship, of finding and making the connections, of contextualizing like crazy, um, uh, and thinking of how we do our disciplines, the humanities, how we do literacy studies. So I'm turning to uh, what literature can help conceive uh, with the migrant uh, situation in Paris, because you know not only Syria is in Paris, but Calais is in Paris as well. Um, so I can give you examples, but maybe I can stop here and examples might be useful for the conversation of what I'm trying to do and what I'm interested in, what some other colleagues are trying to do. And uh, I'll, I'll just conclude by saying that there's a serious culture war coming, even more serious than the one that we've known so far. And so there's a lot of girding our loins to be done. And uh, in that uh, prospect, I think, uh, for my own choice anyway, it will, the effort will be less in uh, not sure that the effort will be, for me, being human, uh, but more uh, being democratic. Um, and hope and fear is better than uh, fear and loathing, <laughs> but I think um, my own options would be strategize and ally. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. <coughs> um, I think at this time I'll, I'll pass the baton to Joanna before opening up the discussion a little bit. Um, I'm just wondering how all this looks from the point of view of a practicing writer. So much I am. Um... I was a bit. Is that, is that okay? Is that okay? Um, it looks terrifying, obviously. Um, it's terrifying because um, I have never seen so many think pieces produced by writers called for by editors um, as I have seen in the last few weeks, certainly a lot post Trump. I don't know a writer who hasn't written a think piece on this. Um, and it seems kind of utterly futile to sort of stack all these words against these things that are happening and going to happen. And I keep thinking and thinking about, you know, how do we see this idea of words and actions and keep trying to look at people who've, um, who've tried who've tried to write about uh, the seeing of the kind of material and, and the conception of the word and, and, and the actor of the word and the material object. Uh, which is when, why it's so interesting to see this, this idea that these copies of movies were left around <coughs> Paris. Because, you know, this is, it's, it's not just a load of words, it's a book, it's a physical material object, it's paper. If this was my copy, I'd prove it to you by reputing it in half, but I don't see that I can. Thank you. Shall sure. I? Oh, sure. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> I, so, I won't prove it. We'll just we'll take it out. Okay, all right. Um, so, <laughs> it is, it's, it's, it's this kind of object, an object of things around which they, they are locations of, um, of many different kinds of, of emotion and belief and um, thought. Uh, so, you know, there's an object, when you put something to an object, it becomes something which can be sentimental, uh, which, which you can attach feelings to. And I think that's such a very interesting thing. Uh, sen sentiment is, is often criticized. I wrote a piece for the Statesman um, in reaction to Trump uh, last week, and I sent it to a friend of mine who's a philosopher. Uh, to just check out the kind of hammer and rent bits, and he said, I don't know. So this is, this, is, this is a bit sentimental, I think, um, about whether it was valid to have a sentimental reaction to this. And I just thought that my questions were different to his. I was just very interested in this idea of the sentimental and the located. You talk about, you know, obviously the title is a movable beast. It is this kind of material, locatable um, thing. But you've also called the um, the theme uh, you've called it is hope and fear, which are very wide concepts and which are not quite so easily locatable in anything physical. They are in fact so entirely conceptual. They're about thinking about the future, thinking about the past. And um, so this kind of idea of, of linking these kind of quite abstract concepts with material objects via an object like the copy of the piece became very interesting to me. Um, I'm going to read a piece which I originally wrote last year, just after the Paris attacks, 
about words and about objects and about how these things could, could come together and whether any of them can approach uh, these things that we have to deal with. Uh, because I did find that this kind of, uh, this, this seeking of words and objects were reactions that people wanted to have. Um, I wanted to talk particularly about the writer Dubravka Ugrizic. I'm a massive fan of her. her. She, of course, um, lived through the, the wars in the 90s in, in the former Yugoslavia and wrote, um, I'll, I'll, I'll read the piece and the point I'm more about her. Um, I wrote this just after I attended a vigil um, at the uh, French Cultural Institute, the Maison Française, in Oxford. Um, everyone stumbled their way through the Marseillaise. Uh, not being able to remember half the words. There was a minute's silence. People came forward to place on the cloth flowers, candles, newspaper clippings, scribbled notes, photographs, small, sometimes unidentifiable objects. And I thought about Dubravka Grisic, and I thought in a state of national emergency, how these stories continue to exist. Dubravka Grisic is a writer who has existed in a state of national emergency since the 1990s when she was branded one of five Croatian witches, women writers who rid ridiculed the nationalistic propaganda of President Franco Tuchman. Everyday life around me changed and became threatening, because it said. When reality became morally and emotionally unacceptable, I spontaneously started to protest. Living in exile in Amsterdam over the intervening 20 years, Ugrisic has not become a Dutch writer but continues to carry this state of national emergency around with her. Before, when I was local, she once said in an interview for Bond magazine, I tried to write globally. Now, when I'm not there anymore, it appears that my themes are more connected with the local. In Good Night Croatian Writers, wherever you may be, the essay that got her into trouble in the first place, she writes, instead of being at the frontier of my country, I would rather walk the frontier of literature or sit on the frontier of freedom of speech. Nationalism, she says in the same one interview, is as dull as toothache. It sings the same song always. And national also, nationalism also means being empowered to change, change cultural memory. That's what people said, that's not me, that's her. Culture is seldom made by those in power, but its frontier is often built by them. <laughs> Words, which have as many beginnings and endings as bricks, may be used to build frontiers, or museums, or other structures. How? I was obsessed with the literary list of literature, says Lukasich, and which literary texts result in an art of literature. There has never been a writer more aware of how one narrative depends on another. Her short novel, Devi Speck in the Jaws of Life, is a patchwork, that's her word, not only a story, but a horoscope, advice, columns, women's magazines. In Lend Me Your Character, Ugrisic overwrites the classics. Retelling others' work, she said, was probably a more liberating and playful act as a reader, which I used to be, than a postmodern gesture. A writer with a profound understanding of the spiral of artifice that is writing, Ugrisic's work insists that literature is never still. She has a way with sub clauses with parentheses. Her, argue, her writing argues with fights against itself. Breaking down the frontiers between life and literature, Ugrisic insists on opening up the jaws of mind to insert the ugly, the awkward, the comic, the annoying, the trivial, and especially the kitsch. Her book, The Museum of Unconditional Surrender, begins with the description of a particularly odd range of objects discovered inside the stomach of a gigantic Walrus named Roland in a museum in Berlin. They include a pink cigarette lighter, a small doll, a box of matches, a baby's shoe, a little plastic bag containing needles and thread. She says the job of collecting is a nostalgic and consoling activity, but it can't bring to life what is lost. Convalescence has begun in the flea market, she writes, and thank you for not reading. But I'm not sure culture can be revived by the mere sale of cultural souvenirs. If an authentic language of culture does appear, and I'm sure it will, it will come from other sources. One source, she says, will be nostalgia. Nostalgia is a 
human feeling, not primarily for objects, but for the feelings, ideas, and processes attached to them. That's me, not her. It's a feeling for the object as a moment that embodies these things, which may be one of the reasons that the Grisich... I have to ask a question um, um, and engage in debate with us. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, there was mentioned there, was it uh, Claire? I can't remember the lady's name. Uh, Claire. That's Claire. right. Claire. 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 Yeah. Claire. So you mentioned uh, that you think there are going to be new culture of wars um, and it sounded very ominous. I was just wondering if you could say more about what you think that would look like. I'm not going to try to participate in, because we hear that all the time and we do it all the time, you know, in um, uh, thinking about what, what, what Trump presidency is going to do to the global um, situation. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, keep to a narrower focus. One is that uh, there has been a culture war in the US Academy, which targeted the humanities in the 90s. Uh, it has a whole history, you could look it up, I mean, it's, it's easy to locate and to identify. Um, um, this was the time of the first Gulf War. It was the time of the neocons, the first generation of, etc. Uh, so you, you probably, I'm not sure you remember it, but, I remember it. <laughs> um, and so I'm thinking something like that is definitely coming back to the US Academy, that's for sure. Uh, on a just slightly wider uh, um, angle, I'm thinking that what's happening with the, with the new uh, legitimacy in the public sphere of Nazism basically uh, but uh, of um, nationalist populisms is the ethnicizing, racializing, nationalizing of politics, of political issues. So we don't have politics anymore, we have identity wars. Uh, and that's terribly dangerous. Uh, and it has no difference. It, 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 uh, it functions exactly in the same system as ISIS does. So that's what I mean. And I, yes, I'm sure it sounds ominous, but that's, that's my mood at the moment. Thank you. fatalism that says um, let's let these bad things happen and then see if we can reclaim the territory in reaction. Um, I suppose I'll, I'll stop there and just ask if the panel has any comment on that uh, point of view. Uh, yeah, I've heard that said too. It seems to be a profoundly dangerous way of approaching things. Um, I, I'm not saying reckless, actually. Um, I, um, I share Claire's worry, sense of honestness, mm. um, about the way that identity politics are going. Um, I was struck to see that uh, Kelly Ann Conway, uh, who was Trump's you know, campaign manager, I don't like to say their mm. names. Mm. I'm getting very superstitious about all of this. Um, but she, uh, she tweeted yesterday, uh, the day before, that um, that it was time that, that it was time um, for America to stop dealing in identity politics, which is what the Republicans had done in their campaign. Right, I don't, lady, I hate to break it to you, but white nationalism is identity politics. Um, you know, Nazism is identity politics, and 
Um, it, it was interesting to, to hear Joanna say that um, your philosopher friend uh, um, criticized you for being sentimental. I too was criticized by a philosopher recently for being sentimental. Um, I think that seems to be their response to what's going on. And, um, and I think that the, um, the anger that people are feeling and the fear, um, it needs expression, it needs expression in, um, it needs ex expression in forms that are appropriate. Um, that are not neutralizing, that are not that are not sort of palliative, and are not just kind of well. Let's just wait and see what happens, and let's you know let's all be reasonable. You can overdo. I'm not going to be reasonable in the face of Nazism. Nazism is not reasonable, and I'm not going to respond to it with reason because reason isn't a good response to it. Um, and in fact, people who tried to respond to it with reason in the past, as we well know, um, did, you know, didn't come out so well there. You know, it, it was not a great time for intellectual or academics either. So, um, so, but we also have to recognize that sentimentality is also a weapon of nationalism, and it can be used against us as much as we can try to use it ourselves. I mean, again, we know, you know Hitler was a profoundly sentimental man um, while he was busily, you know, working out how to murder people more efficiently. So the two are not in any way um, incompatible. Again, as history has shown, I, I, I can ask, what do we do? Which, in a sense, is is what your question gets at. Is you know, what are we supposed to do about this? And while I share Joanna's worry that writing seems very futile and that we're piling up these pieces that nobody's going to read and nobody's, or we're in these little bubbles that only people are, who are already in them are listening to, I'm not going to roll over and let you do this. I'm going to stand up and oppose it, and I'm going to stand up and be heard, even if it is, you know, just my little voice in the in the pile up of words. Um, at least I know that I can go down without a fight. At the moment, two weeks after Trump's election, that's all I got. It's not much. I'm hoping that we can all do better, um, but but I think that I think that just throwing up our hands and saying, "Oh, let them break it, and then we'll clean it up afterwards." <laughs> Again, that's profoundly a historical response. It seems to be profoundly naive, um, and as I say, really reckless. It, may, it actually makes me angry when I hear people say that. I'm, I'm being I'm, I'm surprised at how calm I was in the just story. Um, Joanna's already given us one reading for which many thanks, but uh, I know that Anna Louise has brought some work with her that she'd like to show with us and perhaps give a little introduction to it as well. Yes, yeah, so actually, thank you for that. And this is why I'm going to read this, partly because for me this is some sort of expression of hope. We've had a lot, I think we've got a lot of fear going on here, so I just need to stand closer to my gap. Yeah. And I think that, you know, I think you'll understand why that's the case. But there's hope, I think, in, in this. This is a piece of writing that I did this, um, immediately after the attacks as well last year. But some of the hope that's in it is partly because I did it with students at last year. We were engaged in a, in a project in creative writing, but there were some of the students who were engaged in a similar project this year here tonight. So I think that that in itself is a kind of optimistic basis um, for, for continuing. And, um, and uh, um, yeah, so, so we, were, we were already involved in that project, and then the attacks intervened, and I think for everybody who was in Paris last year, it was particularly difficult, and particularly for those who you know, had made a recent choice of moving to Paris. Um, so we had a plan to be in that part of town, in the 11th Army spot anyway, and, um, and we had quite a long debate as a group, we were going to do a, a session in the street as to whether we should maintain that, uh, that project a week after the attacks had taken place, and we decided to do that, and one of the places we were heading for was the Rue de Charon. So the Rue de Charon, off the Boulevard Voltaire, where one of the bars, which was one of the, you know, the, the targets of the attacks, is, and, um, and we therefore found ourselves moving through one of the shrines, one of the larger shrines, and past the scene of, of, of real, you know, still incredible devastation. Um, and um, we were there, of course, because the Rue Charon is a famous site of an earlier form of violence in the city and the events that happened in 1961, which were the focus of our interest. So this is the small piece that I wrote, and I'm going to ask you afterwards, I'm going to be really direct in my questioning, where you hear the optimism in it, and we can, um, we can take the conversation from there. So, slipping off the beam of the boulevard down the Rue de Charon, I'm closer to the street. The pavements are narrow, the traffic chaotic, I have to dodge and detach. Shop windows are pulling at me with their enticing things, reserving small, mysterious spaces where I think I'd be happy. If I go north, they'll be marginally cheaper, and then significantly cheaper. Before long, there'll be halal butchers, merguez in triangular wreaths, and bookshops with solemn volumes in languages I can't read. But I go south, towards the left bank, another site of Arab Paris. 
my eyes snagging as I go on eclectic mosaics of books in independent bookshops. But what do I know of their eclecticism, if truth be told? Little more than I do of their sober counterparts up the road, though my ignorance is more easily assuaged. I can push the door, make the doorbell ring, stroke their peachy skins. But I press on. My objective is the Institut du Monde Arabe, Jean Nouvel's first declaration on the Parisian landscape and homage to the long reach of French Orientalism. I'm met by a giant photograph for the current exhibition. A headscarf woman is sitting cross-legged with a leather-bound book in her hands. I can't tell if the scarf covers her face too because she's holding the book directly in front of it. She's also levitating in a void. I can levitate too if I want, raised with a hiss to the ninth floor in one of the eight elevators that zip past one another in a chasm behind the lattice steelwork of the building's light-sensitive facade. Up there, I look down river, following the flow of the Seine that has long washed the history of Paris away. It's less than two weeks since the city was ripped into by automatic weapons. <coughs> behind me lies the Latin Quarter, the traditional university area. Study is still largely free in France, and many degree courses have no prior selection process. Ahead of me is the area where most students now live, long since priced out of the left bank. The 11th arrondissement, which I have just crossed, is the densest in the capital, twice as dense as the Parisian average. 66% of housing consists in only one or two rooms, only 13% has four or more rooms. The area is divided between 30% intellectual professions and 50% workers or blue color employees. Social housing constitutes 12% which is under the 36% of its neighboring 19th arrondissement, but still way above where we're gathered here tonight. Since Paris introduced rent control in the summer of 2015, a studio on the Rue de Charonne can't cost more than 25 euros a square meter per month. And in the 11th arrondissement, 65% of studios are between 12 and 20 square meters. These, these figures, hang in front of me as I float above the river, a mantra that I am perhaps also fixing obstinately before my eyes. This is the Paris that was on the terraces north and south of the Boulevard Voltaire and in the Bataclan on November 13. Of 20 or so mosques in central Paris, 12 are in the area of the attacks. These worlds live in very close quarters and the ground has been pulled out from under all of us. So that was Paris last night. The conversation back to, to Hemingway and to Rural Feast um, a little bit while still trying to, to draw on some of the bigger ideas that we've been talking about. I mean, if, if we really wanted to, to talk about um, Paris and, uh, and a feeling of, of uh, war and crisis and tragedy, then the Hemingway book we'd be talking about would be The Sun Also Rises. Um, which is also known as Fiesta. Mm -hmm. And that's where you really get the, the experience of war, and that's where he really draws on his experience as an ambulance driver and what it meant to be, uh, to be wounded and, and his understanding of what the war had done to people. This book, of course, The Little Bull Feast, was written many years later. So the Sun Also Rises was, was written in 1926 in the aftermath of the First World War while he was living in Paris. He wrote it in Paris, and although most, most of it is in Pamplona, it opens and closes in Paris, and there are some wonderful evocations of Paris in the 20s at the beginning of that. But of course, we chose this because it was the book that uh, Parisians chose to, uh, uh, to mark the attacks last year. This book was written across the 1950s, um, and um, into the 1960s, and then Hemingway killed himself in 1961, and this book was unfinished when he died. It was edited by his fourth wife and his publisher, and uh, published in 1964, three years after his death. There are now other versions of it because he left it unfinished and with so many versions and drafts. Um, basically, not to get too much into the, into the detail of this and the family detail of it, but because this is a story, as they written while he was married to his fourth wife, wife, about his first marriage, the grandchildren of his second marriage decided that it wasn't very nice to his second wife, and so they did a different version of the movable piece which makes it look nicer to the second wife. Um, so there were party kind of family politics that were uh, getting involved here, and I bring some of this up because it's important.
important to know that a movable feast is not a true book. It is not a factual book. Um, it is, there are many things that are true in it. Um, it, is a, it is a factual education of Montparnasse, of this neighborhood in Paris. There are many places that he names that are still here, the Closer de Lila, who lived around the corner in the Notre Dame de Champ. Um, he met Scott Fitzgerald for the first time in the Dingo Bar on the Rue de Lange, across the street. Um, so it is an evocation of a Paris that is very real. Um, it is also an, uh, a piece of, of nostalgia. It is a piece of sentimentality. It is profoundly sentimental about his first marriage. Um, and it's also a piece of myth-making. He is, um, he is make, writing his own myth, a myth of his own life and of his own Paris. As I said earlier, it is a love letter to Paris. Um, but myths can have their own truths. And, um, and one way of thinking about myth might be to say that a myth is a history of feelings rather than a history of facts. It's a history of reactions and, and a history of emotions, of how we felt about something, or how we imagined something, or how we remember imagining something. So, or you could say myth is a history of memories, or something like that. So, it, it has its own truths. Um, clearly, there are truths here, as Hemingway saw them many years later, but there are lots of ways in which we can dispute the facts of what he says, or there are different perspectives on it. There are things here that are very, very self-serving. Um, there are things here that are clearly fiction, um, that we can demonstrate our fiction. So it's important, I think, to, to be aware of all of that when we talk about a movable feast, but it is nonetheless the spectacular love letter to Paris. It is a beautiful piece of writing that brings something at the heart of what he loved about Paris to life in a way that is much more moving for a lot of people or it be as moving as, um, as, it, as it's the other subject of the book, which is his tribute to his first wife and his sense of, um, of desolation at having betrayed her. Um, and uh, uh, having betrayed that, that young promise. Um, so we thought we should hear a little bit of Hemingway here. I wanted to choose something that was, um, that was about books and about reading, and there were some wonderful passages in here about reading, because of course he's trying, this is memory of when he's starting out and he's trying to get published, and he's trying to figure out what his art and his craft is going to be. And obviously we didn't want it to be too long, so I've just chosen a little bit that is, um, that's a little bit lighthearted. And also because you know, humor is, speaking of weapons against all these humor is an important weapon in my view, and it's one that we need to keep alive. Um, it can be very, very powerful, and it can really take people down. Trump's not very good at taking humor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it is one of our weapons against him, and I am very happy to use it. So although humor might feel lighthearted in, in, as, a, as a shift in tone in talking about the attacks, as I say, I think, speaking of being human, it's an important expression of our humanity. Um, and one that I, for one, am going to try to, to keep returning to. And just holding on to my optimism. Tomorrow's Thanksgiving. It's American Thanksgiving tomorrow. I have to find something to give thanks for because it's a struggle this year, as we said. Um, so this is uh, from a, a section called People of the Sun. You'll have to pardon my French as well. I'm one of those terrible American monologues. My mother told me I would regret not studying the French harder, and she is, is right. So I apologize for my accent. I'll do my best not to murder you. There were many ways of walking down to the river from the top of the Rue Cardinal de Moine. The shortest one was straight down the street, but it was steep, and it brought you out after you hit the flat part and crossed the busy traffic at the beginning of the Boulevard Saint-Germain onto a dull part where there was a bleak, windy stretch of riverbank with the Isle of Vannes on your right. I think I did that wrong. Uh, this was not like any other Paris market, but was a sort of bonded warehouse where wine was stored against the payment of taxes and was as cheerless from the outside as a military depot or a prison camp. Across the branch of the Seine was the Ile Saint-Louis with the narrow streets and the old, tall, beautiful houses, and you could go over there, or you could turn left and walk along the quay with the length of the Ile Saint-Louis and the Notre Dame and Ile de la Cité opposite you as you walked. In the bookstalls along the quay, you could sometimes find American books that had just been published for sale very cheap. The Tour d'Argent restaurant had a few rooms above the restaurant that they rented in those days, giving the people who lived there a discount in the restaurant. And if the people who lived there left any books behind there, sorry, left any books behind, there was a bookstall not far along the quay where the valet de chambre sold them and you could buy them from the proprietress for a very, for a very few francs. She had no confidence in books written in English, paid almost nothing for them, and sold them for a small and quick profit. Are they any good? She asked me after we had become friends. Sometimes one is. How can anyone tell? 
I can tell when I read them. But still, it is a form of gambling. And how many people can read English? Save them for me and let me look them over. No, I can't save them. You don't pass regularly. You stay away too long at a time. I have to sell them as soon as I can. No one can tell if they are worthless. If they turn out to be worthless, I would never sell them. How do you tell a valuable French book? First, there are the pictures. Then it is a question of the quality of the pictures. Then it is the binding. If a book is good, the owner will have it bound properly. All books in English are bound, but bound badly. There is no way of judging them. After that book sold near the Tour d'Argent, there were no others that sold American and English books until the Quai de Grand Augustin. There were several from there on, on to beyond the Quai Voltaire that sold books they bought from employees of the Left Bank Hotels, and especially the Hotel Voltaire, which had a wealthier clientele than most. One day I asked another woman, stallkeeper, who was a friend of mine, if the owners ever sold the books. No, she said, they are all thrown away. That is why no one knows they have at the time. No, she said, they are all thrown away. That is why one knows they have no value. Friends give them to them to read on the boats. Doubtless, she said, they must leave many on the boats. They do, I said. The line keeps them and binds them, and they become the ship's libraries. That's intelligent, she said. At least they are properly bound then. Now, look like that would have value. Thank you. to the idea of books as objects and, and the way books circulate and pass between people and the, and the meanings they accrue on the way, both as having sentimental content but also having sentimental value to the others. Yeah, yes, yeah. Well, I think it's kind of, kind of thinking about uh, when the last you know, I guess, uh, I think on the whole, I was thinking of responding to several questions beforehand, though, by saying that, you know, one book that I would advise everybody to read, if I can, you know, in this context, which is not a book which, which is old enough to have accrued much sentimental value as an object, yet is this huge notes to the period of formative assembly. Um, partly because, um, coming back to this idea of, of, of being human as a theme, um, I, I was just looking through some of my notes on it before we started speaking. And um, she says, perhaps human is the name we give to this very negotiation that emerges from being a living creature amongst cre other living creatures and in the midst of forms of living that exceed us. And these forms of living that exceed us, I think she talks about mostly things that can be defined in words, so they're, they're really ideas, these forms of living that, that, we, that we put down, which are um, you know, things like, like democracy. Um, and like identity um, and how these are negotiated. And I, I very much like the word negotiation. So in terms of the difference between these physical objects of books and what's written in them, which are kind of two different things, but they're very interdependent, even if even if a document online has to have <coughs> some kind of materiality, it takes you time to kind of read through it, to scroll down it. There's, there's a certain kind of material process going on, which is something to do with processing it a space, you know, it's a virtual space. Um, so I, I just, I'm just kind of very interested in that idea of nego negotiation as, as in that extract where um, the woman who's selling the books has no idea of the content of the books, but there is, but is very interested in the kind of, you know, the materiality of the books. And so these two things pull against each other, but are also kind of indisputably locked within each other because each book which is valued for its content has been better bound and the books which are not valued are uh, left on the boats until someone who wants to value them for, uh, who may not know the content uh, values them until they become something valuable, something something to which values can be attached once more. I guess uh, it's true of this book now, isn't it? It'll never be the same book again, precisely because of mm -hmm. the role it played uh, immediately after the Paris attacks. And I was wondering if you know, there are other books that had a similar kind of status. Or indeed, mm -hmm. what books are now being read to get over the post-Trump? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <Curious. laughs> Any Malian literature for palliative care? Um, well, look, a lot of people are, are reading the books and, and, and watching films as well that have tried to imagine what American fascism might look like, homegrown fascism. So there are things like The Man in the High Castle, which is the counterfactual of what would happen if the Nazis had won the war, but um, much more, uh, I think, much more um, apropos, sadly, um, of what's not sad and not sad the Nazis didn't win the war, let's be clear about that. Um, 
but of the story about homegrown fascism. So Philip Roth's The Plot Against America is a book that many, many people are referencing. Um, if you don't know it, it was, he wrote it about 10 years ago. And, um, and it imagines what would have happened if Charles Lindbergh, who was an anti-Semite, um, who did um, think about running for president in the 30s, if he had won the presidency instead of Roosevelt, what would have happened to America and the rise of anti-Semitism. And one of the things that's so brilliant about the book is that he doesn't try to go too far into the future. He just, he just leaves you with this sense that terrible things are about to happen. Um, but the, and, and he's very, very good on how people, um, how, how people, and it goes back to Tom's point, how people just sort of said, oh, it can't be that bad, it's not going to be that bad, I just let them do it, it'll be fine, and it wasn't fine, right? So he has a very powerful, uh, and of course, as with so many prophetic books, people said, you know, uh, you know, he's a crank, and what's he thinking, and and because books are only prophetic once history proves them true, right? So there's that one. Um, there's also Sinclair Lewis's It Can't Happen Here, mm -hmm. um, which was written in 1936, which people again have been referencing. It's not a very good book um, as a piece of writing. I, would, I don't necessarily recommend it as a novel. It's not, it's not nearly as, as artful as The Plot Against America, um, but it's very clear. And, um, and it's, a, and it's a, 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 written in the midst of the rise of fascism by an American who understood very um, well um, the political situation and the, and the realities of American culture. Um, I've actually also been watching some films that are about this. Um, one of the lesser known Spencer Tracy, Catherine Hepburn films is about an American fascist. It's called Keeper of the Flame. And, there, and Catherine Hepburn gives this kind of amazing speech about fascism at the end, which I found slightly heartening. Um, and, um, and of course, things like Citizen Kane, yeah. um, which is a book, of, uh, a book, a film, I think everyone's a book, um, is a film about, um, about a, a fascist populist demagogue. Um, I've also been thinking about um, All the King's Men, um, about Huey Long. So for me, I'm, I'm turning to fiction from people who lived through the rise of fascism um, to try to see what we can learn from them, what they saw, how they pushed back. Um, I'm not sure I have any consolatory books, except you know, the kind of proper escapist fiction, you know, let's just hide our heads and pretend this isn't happening. Um, would you perhaps sort of start to think about wrapping up, but um, before we do that, I'd just like to invite Claire, uh, and perhaps um, also I know Louise, if you have any further comments you'd like to make. I know that Joanna wants to make Joanna wants to make I was going to say, um, yeah. in response to you, that uh, Spencer, Tracy, Kevin Pepper, who was written by because there were so many refugees coming into Hollywood at the time. And I was just going to mention that, of course, in *Little War Beast, there's this kind of veneer of expats, perhaps, um, people who voluntarily come to Paris because it's cheap, because you can practice art there. But a lot of the minor characters that he mentions are refugees, particularly Russian refugees uh, from the First World War, from the Soviet Revolution. Um, and so it is a book that has this <coughs> of how the, the, the Paris of the 20s was a Paris of, of, of refugees. It was international, it was exciting. Um, it was it was cheap, and there was a lot going on there purely for those reasons. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's an excellent point. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I wanted to give a little bit more um, texture to what Paris means at the time that is um, novelised um, in um, *Movable Feast*, but. Um, I think my uh, quick comment will be what kind of literature I'm turning to, uh, both as a personal you know, reaction, but also in my work as a humanist. Um, I'm turning, I don't know, well, I'll just give you this as an experience, you know, I, I, I don't have a self-critical kind of, um, but I'm definitely turning like crazy um, you know, uh, there's a pressure for me to do it and to pile up in fact, I've got three in my in my three new ones in my bag today. Uh, on literature, um, well, let me say, the, the issue is that France has a serious post-colonial problem and that that's What's happened, you know, that, that's the nerve that was hit uh, with the attacks. And Trump is, is, is again, a, because Trump means nothing but Ben locally, as, as we know. Um, so the literature I'm, I'm 
discovering, because I never really went for it, is I'm designing at the moment a comparative literature course on Islamic literatures in French and English, for instance, um, because I can't speak you know, any of the languages that actually um, produce in Muslim countries uh, other than English and French, because, for instance, India writes in English um, from a Muslim cultural background. Um, oh yeah, and um, there is enough of an interface between uh, Islamic culture, Islamic history, and Islam Islamic literature, both classic and super contemporary, and dealing with and giving a different point of view, because I, I think to me that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the points of views that are being completely obscured, violently obscured by the new identity projects, you know, by white supremacy, by Europe, by national preference in France and so on. So to me the energy, the cultural energy, the, the energy literature, that's where I feel that it's coming. Um, and yeah, there is enough of that literature written in English and in French, which is an interface to the literature that I have access to, uh, to have a proper contact with it. Uh, and the contact, the beauty of that contact, is that the critical force of it, because the contact is the inheritance of, of the colonial encounter. And so the, that literature is actually working, uh, exploring, uh, the whole dimension of that legacy, and to me, it's going to tell me a lot more uh, about the current situation and the immediate future than French literature uh, or literature produced in Paris by Parisians. So can you give us some names? Can you give us some recommendations? Absolutely. Can you give us some recommendations? Oh God. Um, <laughs> Well, I, I, what I've got on my bedside table at the moment, I have, uh, it's not actually a Muslim writer, but I have uh, John Burgess, uh, A Seventh Man, Illusion de l'immigré aux souffrances, sorry, Des illusions de l'immigré aux souffrances de l'immigré. So, emigration and immigration, and uh, that interface. Um, There's just some examples. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and on, on that note of encouragement and of optimism, I think we will we'll stop. But uh, we we'll also continue because we have an opportunity uh, to partake in a move movable feast, which has just been moved in uh, to the back, and to socialise a little bit and do all those things that make us human. So thank you very much to the panel. They've done an excellent job of raising our consciousness about what Hemingway, Hemingway's movable feast meant at the time of the Paris attacks a year ago. Thank you very much. Anyway, we expect us all to have a drink. <laughs> <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs>